So I'm going to get them started, but I, I do, I have to go on record as being just so honored that the stage of star and screen, Dustin Hoffman is here presenting to us today. Let's give Dustin a round of applause. You guys saw you. Thanks, that never gets old, I'll tell you. <laughs> You can still tell me, dude. <laughs> you can tell your friends later. Uh, the only people that seem to get that anymore are uh, either really old bank tellers or uh, people not from this country. Like, oh, that, that a famous actor. Um, hey, thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate you being here. You could be any, at any other talk right now, but you chose mine, so um, I am thankful for that. <clears throat> this is uh, What the Watchers See, Weaknesses in Municipal Mesh Network Deployments. Uh, I'm Dustin Hoffman. Uh, and I'm TK. Wait, wait. What? I got to talk about me first. Do your things. Do your yeah, okay. Go. That's um, I'm, I own and I'm also senior engin a senior engineer at Exigent Systems. It's uh, an IT services firm. Uh, I'm also principal at uh, various other concerns. Um, <clears throat> I also like to CrossFit, so if you have a Fran time, you want to come tell me afterwards. We'll compare Fran times. And this is my colleague, TK. Yeah, I guess I'm a senior engineer over at Exigent Systems. We, we don't do the title thing too much, but that one seems to We seems make to them work. up every yeah, August, Yeah, we actually. make them up pretty much every time. Um, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot other to say about, about, about that, apart from being a principal at 3 Kappa Research, which is, I guess, a vulnerability thing that uh, they were thinking about starting up. Oh, it started. Oh, it started. Yeah, I believe it. So, uh, on with the actual talk. How this all got started for us was uh all right, you gotta stop talking excuse me for a second oh shit. Yeah. excuse me for a second we have a tradition here at defcon uh these two are both first time speakers i no. you're no, no just me i'll take just I'll, you i'll take both shots it's all right all right well we got one first time speaker so they're both taking it all right uh, the the tradition is we have a <laughs> we welcome new speakers by uh allowing them to enjoy a shot with us so I'm, I'm going to go on record. You do a much better job of pouring than Proctor. Uh, well, that's <laughs> what I do. All right, cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers. Salute. I'll take that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Carry on. Thanks. <clears throat> so how this all got started for us, Obviously, in the post-9-11 world, um, a lot of municipalities are taking Homeland Security money, or really any money is available, uh, amidst the time that they still have shrinking budgets. And they're using technology maybe to bolster an otherwise shrinking police force, or to provide some feeling of security, uh, or oversight, or surveillance um, across, throughout, their, throughout their city. Like I said, this is primarily about municipalities. But in the city that we are, we're often in, um, we started to see these camera pods, and, and there'll be plenty of pictures later. Uh, camera pods and directional antennas spring up uh, hither, thither, and yon. And um, being the curious souls that we are, um, we kind of were curious about that. Who wouldn't be? At least I think everyone in this room would be. And uh, in certain places, um, on my phone, it would be like, hey, there's an open Wi-Fi network available. And they had interesting names like police department. <laughs> um, and this is before the era of, you know, FBI surveillance van 004, right? So this is, this is uh, you know, starting in 2008, 2009. So for me, that's how it started. He has his own unique interaction um, with these things. So while drunkenly hanging around downtown one night, a few friends and I are wandering around and we, we find this fountain that's downtown and I decide to climb on top of it, which may not have been the wisest thing in the world, but I did that, and here I am acting like a clown, and lo and behold, a voice comes from above that says, this is the police. Please get off the fountain. <laughs> which, and it sounded like it was probably about the 150th time that the guy had said that. But I, of course, look around in a scared, you know, daze, wondering what the hell's going on, and I see, oh, of course, the camera pod that, that Dustin was talking about, and I don't know, it, I guess I wasn't really all right with being observed sort of all the time. And, and so that's kind of what put me on to wanting to go look at these things and see, and see what they were about and all that stuff. And then we said, did see, as you said, the uh, 
you can see that there's a wireless network available, even even just walking by with like your iPhone or something like that. And two-way audio and a number of other things that, that we'll cover. A little creepy. So one of the first things I thought, thought of after thinking about the fact that even in a relatively small town, our town being around 70,000 people, by no means a large city, um, I thought of this article uh, that I'd encourage you to read. You can find it on Wired it's called The Transparent Society. Has anyone, ever, has anyone encountered it or read it, Transparent Society? It, if you like science fiction, especially, I'm way into like dystopian, post-apocalyptic science fiction. But this short story describes a society, two societies, one uh, both ubiquitously surveilled. But in one, basically only the authorities can view the camera. In the other, every citizen has equal access to all the video and how that might affect. And it's an interesting thought experiment. One of the things that I think civil libertarians and, and, and people like myself um, are concerned about with this kind of thing is that the information is so asymmetric that certain privileged privilege people have access to it, but people like us don't. There's, there's no audit trail. There's, we don't know how people are using it. Um, so those are some of the issues that we'll cover along with uh, the vulnerabilities. You might ask, why are municipalities deploying such networks? Once you deploy a network, I often describe it to our clients as, well, when you have a nice network in place, it's like building a road. All kinds of other fantastic things can spring up alongside it. It's, it's like a utility. Cities are using them, um, uh, to obviously, to monitor traffic in intersections and on main and other roads, monitor public spaces. Um, they have two-way audio. Um, I know in the city, in the specific city that we'll be talking about um, in our talk today, you have issued, you, they use um, infrared uh, sensors to monitor parks after hours. So, you know, if you, go, if you enter one of the city parks after dusk, you'll get the, the same ubiquitous voice. Oh, you know, city parks are closed at dusk. They got a real nice video of some kids running away, actually. They, they just, like, you see them look and then they just scatter. <laughs> Which presumably is what, is what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, Frequently in the RFPs for these things, you'll see cities talk about, you know, we've got a shrinking police budget, and this is a force multiplier for us. It lets us be everywhere. Whether or not everyone is okay with them being everywhere is another question. I think of the uh, automated uh, uh, speeding ticket uh, robots, if you will, that they deployed in Arizona that the voters, you know, flipped out about, right, maybe rightly so, and uh, complained about. But if you were speeding, uh, these devices were parked on the side of the road. You've probably seen them. Like, your current speed is this. And if it's, you're going too fast, it blinks at you. Um, these would actually just read your license plate number if you were going too fast and then mail you a ticket. So truly automated enforcement. Um, so that's one of the reasons the cities are deploying things like this. The implementation is almost universally a mesh network. Um, I'll, uh, why? Why not a wired network? Nobody wants to trench. Um, and the, but like I said, the budgets are shrinking. So wireless technology held, holds the promise, at least to, let's say, a city council or some other budget committee, of a dramatically lower cost. I don't know if any of you have ever been involved with a project like um, actually stringing fiber, fiber like across streets or down city blocks. Uh, the licensing process and the costs are, are, are substantial. Um, it'll, it'll easily exceed the cost of, let's say, the endpoint equipment like cameras and whatnot. Uh, you can also deploy it much faster. Most of these things operate on unlicensed bands, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. These are, these are not special unlicensed bands. Who actually does the installs? And I think this will be a key part of our talk. <clears throat> you have sp specialized companies that really focus just on municipalities and other kinds of government organizations. Uh, for, and the one in particular would be like Leverage IS. Um, they have special qualifications and basically they're, basically, I hate to say special qualifications, <laughs> basically they're able to fill out a really long, arduous RFP process um, and then meet other qualifications like, yeah, we've worked with cities before. So these tend to become the, the prime vendors um, in, 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 in installs like this. Not technical qualifications. Yeah, they're not technical <laughs> qualifications as you'll see. Not at all. So, hey, first picture on their website is, you know, a smartly dressed policewoman, um, pr presumably providing real-time response to real-time crime, including climbing on fountains. She's scaring those kids. Um, this is, and if you look at their vestigial Twitter site, which hasn't tweeted in like a year or two, um, they only follow other police agencies. So it's a, it's a specialized company built um, specifically to provide. The typical driver for this is police forces. That's who you'll see um, driving these kinds of camera installs. The implementation hardware itself, 
not terribly interesting. Um, things you've even encountered, maybe just packaged differently. Um, specifically, we see a lot of this fire-tied equipment, um, which is a mesh uh, node vendor. Uh, they were recently bought by Unicom. You'll see normal cameras. Uh, I misspelled Bosch there, but it, it's, it still pronounces right. Bosch cameras, normal DVRs. So here's some of the equipment we picked, off, picked up off of eBay. Um, it looks like this. Um, not really in a special packaging. It's our highly advanced lab. Yeah, on the carpet. Yeah, super fancy. Um, 2.4 gigahertz antennas here. Uh, a couple ports in the back. They usually stick these in outdoor enclosures. Nothing fancy. I mean, we, there's plenty of it available on eBay. We didn't pay a lot. We don't have a big budget for DEF CON. Um, you can even, in fact, off DEF CON, off, off DEF CON, off eBay, you can buy um, some units that are licensed that, I don't, know if they're li I don't know if you can use them licensed, but they have radios to operate on actually restricted um, public services networks. It's like 4.9. I don't know. I, I think it's 4.9. So speci information specific to FireTide, you should talk about it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, basically, they're just little boxes. And, and, and as far as the people who are using them are concerned, they, in one end, you plug an Ethernet cable. And on the other end, you plug in an Ethernet cable. Magic happens. And the packet makes it over to the other side. Um, we did a, kind of a small amount. And I actually have to thank a few guys from, uh, from another, uh, another company that I worked at who helped me out a lot with this, Jordan Hayes. And by the way, he did indeed attend the conference. So UCR can write that check. Um, Vasilios and Lou the Shoe, all these guys, I don't know if I could have done it without them, or at least I couldn't have done my part without, uh, without their help. My favorite story, though, is they're like, hell, you want some help with this? Oh, for DEF CON, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, DEF CON 23? We're like, no, no, yeah. no, no, this one, like in a couple weeks, so thanks for that. Yeah, well, they, they, they really pulled it out. Um, well, really with these, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm losing my track here. Just talk about the technical specifics, the file system, and everything else you guys uncovered. It's worthwhile. We got as far as sort of taking. We, we reverse engineered a little bit, and we were able to find out a little bit of information. It kind of it kind of looks like these things are using something, like they're using. Uh, what am I looking for? Oh man, automated uh, source routing or reverse sort. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, in any case, basically, where in every packet there's a header that contains like every single hop that the packet must take in, in order to go forward. And they added on some bits as well, I think, like uh, signal strength to kind of help with their, their, their routing, basically, so they can make sure that it, uh, it's a good system that you know, automatically heals itself and all that stuff. And I, in this case, I think they just sort of relied on the fact that auto mesh is sort of a trade secret. And uh, I don't know if it's really a trade secret, but they, they deliberately made it a little bit uh, hard to understand in the patents, et cetera. And I think they just relied on that as a sort of obfuscation rather than actually using security on these things. Um, I don't know if there's anything really more we did in the RE department. If you use any equipment like uh, any embedded box, any small low power system, it's going to be very similar to this. Really the only unique thing about FireTide as a vendor is specifically that they have a, a patented and proprietary mesh networking protocol uh, called, that they call AutoMesh. Um, it's, it's certainly derived from other <clears throat> actual documented protocols. This protocol is not documented. Um, a large amount of our time was spent with, as far as we know, the first actual decoding of the protocol. Um, a full, de a full decoding of, um, would permit actual interoperability, uh, which we talk about in a, in a bit. So typically you'll see with these deployments, um, like I said, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz deployments, open standards. Um, in this case, in, uh, with leverage, they deploy fire tied equipment and it uses auto mesh, which is, like I said, not documented. Um, in all the city's documents, which you can crawl on their website, 2.4 is in use, but it's not mentioned. They only mention using 9 mega, 900 megahertz and 5 gigahertz. So it later makes me wonder, as you see the sloppy, sloppy implementation they did, if perhaps they aren't even aware that the 2.4 gigahertz, gigahertz radios are turned on. Let me talk about mesh in general. I think it'll help if for anyone who doesn't have a, a clear understanding on this. With, a, with any other kind of network, let's say, especially a wired network or a normal Wi-Fi network, uh, you typically assume that a, a client node, um, let's say, you know, streaming video to my phone, that it has a reliable path back to the access point or the switch or to some other um, 
some other more centralized uh, distribution point. With Mesh, you don't, and that's the advantage of it. Um, all the nodes are peers. Um, this peer may be actually able to talk to the backhaul, whereas this peer can't. So this peer will route its traffic through another peer to get to, let's say, the network DVR ultimately. And that's the advantage here. Um, we don't have to string fiber all the way you know, to the far end of the city. We can deploy multiple mesh nodes and make hops. So here in my first example with YRDC, um, all five outer nodes have a presumably a reliable or at least a semi-reliable link to the center node. In a mesh, other nodes can route the traffic through other peer nodes. This is actually, if you were ever going to do anything malicious, just crawl the city's website because the information they provide is voluminous and incredibly useful uh, if you had ill intent. This image uh, out of our slides is right off their website. It documents specific antenna placement, um, buildings they are out off of. That's, is it terribly small? Oh, it is it's terribly small. small. Oh, I'm sorry. Things you can't know before you get here. Um, where they actually describe, and we'll make the slides available to anybody who wants them. Apologies for the, for the small images. You actually see the camera pods de um, described and all the hop locations. Um, and from this, you can derive, for example, which antennas go where. Like I said, auto mesh in the deployments, not documented. They claim they have 19 patents on it to date. Um, there are certain things that you can assume about it that it's going to do a lot of the same things that all the other mesh protocols are going to do, uh, link health from node to node, other things like that. From reading many, many dry technical documents, uh, we discover that it also embeds things like uh, each node's particular altitude, uh, the GPS coordinates, presumably preset during install, or perhaps it, can, uh, it actually has a GPS receiver, things like this, which can contribute to um, the idea is that with auto meshes, you don't have to do as much pre configuration prior to node deployment. You want to talk about the specifics? For sure, yeah. So we set up our, our, little, our lovely lab on the carpet, as you saw before, and when we're looking at the traffic that's actually going out over the air, it sort of it starts out with kind of standard. I wish I could point at it for you, but I can't. But you can see at the beginning there, there's uh, the standard issue 802.11 headers and all that stuff. And then additionally, there's an IP header, which is, of course, standard. And that points to, uh, oh, I can point. How about that? Uh, that points to here, which is the mesh IP, which is, it looks a little weird. It usually starts with a one. But uh, as far as I know, everything's normal about that. The protocol set to, Proto 134, which is allegedly for RSVP for the end-to-end -end ignore kind of packet, which I, I don't know too much about that, but I know that what follows is not in fact RSVP. Um, and so then we move on to the, the header right here. This, this, is, this is what actually follows uh, that last IP header. And this is what I think is the, the auto mesh header. And you can see right at the beginning there that the F9, I believe that's the mesh ID. Um, there are only, only very few. There's only 256 possible mesh IDs. Auto mesh uses this <clears throat> specifically to identify which mesh, let's say if you had multiple meshes deployed in the same geographic region, um, which mesh this node is a part of. It's, this is part of auto mesh's secret sauce. Um, this is one of the few things that you define prior to deployment. Um, it's worth noting that auto mesh, because it isn't documented, it's, I th and we'll talk about it later as well in more detail. We believe this is part of what most of these deployments believe provides some of the security that they think they have, um, specifically that it's not documented. And you can't load up, for example, a packet capture in Wireshark and get very far because it chokes on auto mesh. Um, at this point, Wireshark does not have a decoder for auto mesh. It'd be really cool if it did. Um, one of our goals was to, you know, to help, that, help that along. It's a, I mean, how many people use Wireshark? It's super helpful, right? And to be able to decode all these protocols, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it chokes on this, um, specifically because there's no public uh, definition of, of, of what the protocol does. And it's not, we haven't entirely decoded it here, uh, but we can see that there are a couple fields that are probably flags and stuff like that. Um, and actually, the next one is, this, this right here is a unicast frame. Um, and there's just not very much information included for the auto mesh part, but this is a broadcast frame, and I think what they've done here is they've attached a little bit of information, but maybe some flooding for getting routes and stuff like that. Um, and you can see that right after the mesh ID, it's now th the last bit is one, which means it's almost always a broadcast. I was not able to find 
any packets that had that set at one that were not broadcast. And then you have some a couple like TLV values here. I'm pointing again at the screen like you can see me. Uh, there are a couple of TLV values here where you can see it's a presumably a type and then a length and then you know, you've got whatever this might be which I think is, like I said, probably some routing info. Uh, and then there's this chunk that comes after that which I assume is, again, the path that it's going to take. I notice within here you can see repeated several times, you know, some spots that look like they might be IP addresses and these right here are definitely the IP addresses of external, or they match actually the external IP of, uh, of that first IP header that we looked at. So I assume that it uh, represents the idea of the node that we're entering in perhaps. Um, and then it goes to a multicast address which I assume has something to do with the routing. Conveniently they've left for us, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, conveniently left for us a little marker at the end, a little kind of EOF type thing that you can use to just sort of strip this out entirely which f for when they have it unencrypted as they, they sometimes do um, and in our lab of course there is a, there's an easy, easy, easy way to just skip all the auto stuff, auto mesh stuff and go right to the payload so you can look at it. Like we were able to send some packets across our little setup and just pull them right out of the air uh, which kind of takes away their, their safety from the obfus obfuscation there. Yeah. Um, and then this is just an example of something that was passed over it. It's just this is a CDP packet. Um, not much to talk about here other than you can see that it's in the clear after the auto mess header is done with. So our specific case, uh, thanks for sticking through all the background. I'd hate to skip ahead and not have everyone appreciate some of the, sometimes the, the folly that you see in these things. Um, in, a, in this specific city, um, you see we've mapped out um, most all, a lot of. There's apparently how many cameras are there actually deployed in this small city? Oh, something like 122, I think. And that's not including what they have deployed over all, their, all the school sites. Uh, the city and the school district have apparently jo uh, joined hands, and um, they've kind of aggregated all their camera feeds together. So just in a small city, the the primary collection here is there's the pointer is downtown. This is kind of the downtown. This is where the infamous fountain is. Um, Oddly enough, from the time the initial RFP for this, for this system was uh, released back in 2006 until literally 72 hours ago, the, the entire system was unencrypted. So no WEP, no WPA, nothing. Everything was sent in the clear. So, you know, friends, there's a lot of things that we can't know in life. Like one of the things I, I'm still trying to figure out is does the Malware Bytes logo, is it actually supposed to look like a Wu-Tang Clan? I can't, I haven't just, <laughs> the world may never know. But in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and put myself as best I can from servicing other IT clients and put myself in the, in the shoes of um, the city manager and maybe the people who did the original install. My, my, my best guess is that they were under the assumption that auto mesh alone would provide the security because it was obscured, because you couldn't just load it up and, and, and read it right off the, let's say, without additional effort. It was secure enough. I think this is part of the problem with when we use words like security. I don't know about you. I feel like the word security is very ill-defined. Um, I think Bruce Schneier said it best in the, in the opening to his Applied Cryptography books where, book where he said um, there's two kinds of encryption in the world, the kind that keeps your kid sister from reading your diary and the kind that keeps multinational corporations and governments from reading your diary. And I think it's the same thing here. I, I, I have to wonder if at the, end of the, at, the, at the end of the install, if the, you know, the QA manager, well, I'm being very generous assuming there is one, didn't look at the form and go, well, is it secure? Yeah, it's secure. We're going to check that box. Or it's a matter of, well, I turned the knob and the door didn't open. Yeah, but if you lean on it a little, does it just does it pop right out? It's kind of one of those things. And I think as taxpayers, especially as you go to the next slides, you ought to cringe because we're, this was all tax money. This is all something that you and I came out of our pockets. And, and here we are, frankly, ill-served by, um, you know, the, I was thinking of this this morning. I thought of the Obamacare website, right? How um, shoddy government contractors provided, you know, you know, presumably took a lot of money and provided maybe a, a not a great product. I feel like you'll, I feel like you'll have shades of that he, uh, repeatedly as we go through the next slides. But 72 hours ago, WEP was turned on. I, yeah, so yay for government efficiency, right? Um, was it because of our talk that, you know, that was going to, I don't know. I'm going to say it was though. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin and TK, moving the bar of security forward to 1999. Yes. One peg at a time. Uh, <laughs> oh, you should read these later. Okay, so here's what, the, here's what you'll, you'll commonly see. 
Um, these are camera. These are the camera pods watching you. Here's a loudspeaker, right? Here's the little uh, all-weather enclosures. Lots of directional antennas. When you see things like this, right, I, I get nervous. I have to wonder if, um, you know, hey, those directional antennas will provide us a lot of security, right? Because they only send that signal to one other place. <laughs> I wonder if you could feel, think back to when you didn't know as much as you know. If you did things that looking back, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that was a really bad idea. That, that didn't work out quite as well as I thought. Because I have moments like that. Uh, when I started the, the company that I run now, I look back and go, that was a really bad idea not at all safe or secure. And maybe you just got by by the skin of your teeth. I think that may have been what went on here too, right? Hey, we've got auto mesh. It's, it's obscurated. Um, no one can read the video streams. We've got directional antennas. No one else is going to see Redlands police pop up on their, uh, on their phone as an open access point. I think we're good here, guys. And there's, uh, there's one of the fire tide boxes right there uh, in, a, in another enclosure. But uh, vendor, having vendor names here, um, Great maybe idea. not the best idea. They were installing another, another pod um, right by our office, and uh, they had some vendor out, uh, you know, like a bucket truck. And uh, I stopped to take pictures because he had the door open uh, to this thing. And that guy got all upset about it, and he shut the box on me. I was trying to take pictures with my camera. Here's the highest point in the city, um, this eight-story building, uh, festooned with cameras. And uh, this is the high point that they all route it back to. You can see these things are uh, hopping up everywhere. This picture makes the city look really bad, by the way. Oh, uh, you know. <laughs> don't vacation They did here. put cameras everywhere. I mean, come on. Uh, this is more cameras, more, more uh, PA devices. Trees. I'm not sure what I find more obnoxious, the cameras or the PA thing. <laughs> the being yelled at by a city official is, or a police department. Yeah. This sign makes it all okay, though, because you have given notice that it's under surveillance by the police department. I think they have run afoul, though, of the notice. Have they not? Did you not tell me this recently? You mentioned some of this. Well, I, can't, I, I can't say for sure, but I, I want to say that there, this is not sufficient. It has <laughs> to, you have to have these notifications a, a lot more places than they have them. And it's not exactly downtown, either. It's kind of like on one of the ways that you can get into downtown and, never, and nowhere else. I've never seen this sign, which is weird. So as it was until 72 hours ago, which is not fair that I got here. You know, they changed it just before we came. So I'm, I'm still, still smarting on that. <clears throat> Here's, here are the security problems and the potential issues with having it as is. Um, and when you have one vendor doing the install, right, they've got a playbook. Um, and I'm, I'm confident you'll look around and look at the other places. Because when, when, uh, when a company like Leverage gets uh, a government contract, they, they, croon, they, you know, they, they croon about it. Um, they're going to tell everybody. It, it furthers their uh, prestige in the, in the small community that they're in. Uh, Santa Monica, for example, has a deployment by them. Other cities larger than us. <clears throat> so assuming, like smart people like us do, that directional antennas and, uh, and an um, obfuscated um, network protocol is not enough, at the minimum, and I, 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 I'm going to date myself, but I was saying this back in, like, you know, in 98, at my last corporate gig, that uh, people were going to deploy wireless networks not realizing that it reaches beyond the walls of their office building or their home or other places like that. All of a sudden, you have access to the transmission medium, right? Before, with a wired network, you'd have to go and put a tap on it. That's at least harder. You know, wireless gets in places you didn't plan on. Um, and that's exactly what we have here. Another one, how many of you have ever gotten, this is my favorite, and I'm not sure what to do about them. I, I typically play along like a rube, but how many of you gotten that call where it's like, hi, this is your bank center calling, and uh, there's been fraud on your account. Can you go ahead and read me your 16-digit card number? Yeah, I have, and I'm worried there's fraud, right? So I'd probably give it to them. Was anyone here at the talk um, the gentleman gave, and the name escapes me, it, it deserves m more recognition than I'm going to give it, but um, where they impersonated a GSM cell tower, Right, and there was all these warnings outside the door. None of you were here for that? Okay. The lights are bright, okay? They don't call me eagle eyes. Um, so yeah, great talk. Um, and what was the, uh, the key thing I took away from that was that you don't have both parties authenticating the other, right? The phone has to authenticate itself, uh, dutifully authenticates itself against the, uh, against the tower, but the tower does not have to authenticate itself as a legitimate tower. You have the same thing here. With this setup, Buying eBay hardware, you could, even just through ARP spoofing, well, a much dirtier, simpler method, you could easily become a node on their mesh. 
All you have to know is the mesh ID, which can be read right off the I'd say off the wire, right off the air. That mesh ID, and there's only 256 unique co combinations here. It's eight bits. You read it off, and you can join their network. You can participate. Um, and what can you do with that? Well, if you're a member of the mesh, remember, in a mesh, um, presumably because it's wireless, the health of the network is changing at any given time based on, I don't know, uh, fog or uh, all kinds of weather conditions or other electromagnetic transmissions in the area. Um, one node can report to the other nodes on the network, hey, I've got a great view from here to the backhaul. Got fantastic signal strength. Y'all should route all your traffic through me. And let that sink in. A rogue node on the network, unlike a wired network, you'd have to be in just the right position, right, to sniff the traffic. Not so with a mesh network. You could actually have all the traffic routed through you just by issuing a favorable packet, saying, I've got a fantastic, view, you know, uh, fantastic link to that last hop that you need to get to the city's DVR. I don't have to sit and sniff um, just with the cameras that I'm in range of. I can actually just request all camera feeds to be fed through me or VoIP traffic or whatever other city services um, is present on that network. All the equipment presumably also supports encryption of their own transmissions, cameras, um, the audio, the infrared transmitters, all of those do, never turned on. Like I said, using a directional antenna to secure the medium, simply not sufficient. If I'm picking it up while I'm driving around, something's gone wrong. Um, you know, this isn't, I've, if, some of you may have worked with actual optical transmitters where, you know, you shoot a laser, um, you know, to another, uh, to, use, to make a wireless link. Well, you'd actually have to get literally in between the two access points, to, to, uh, the, to the transmitter and the receiver to pick it up. Not so here. Antennas leak in directions that you're not prepared for. Uh, I mentioned content encryption. A fantastic feature of FireTide, and I don't want anyone to think I'm knocking FireTide. I'm really, I really actually feel bad for the city, and I'm really putting all the blame on the implementation vendor. Um, FireTide boxes actually support um, mesh node authentication. You can actually, via PKI, via certs, you can actually have one node authenticate itself on the mesh to all the other nodes. It's really fantastic. Not turned on. They didn't check that box. Yeah, that box didn't get <laughs> checked, apparently. Um, Again, auto mesh or any other protocol to, obscu to, uh, to obfuscate. I really got to check my obscuration. Don't look at my typo. Um, simply not sufficient. So really what we've seen is a completely botched implementation. And isn't that what we often see in security? Security is hard, is it not? What do we see? Was, was, open SSL, was SSL itself actually broken? Certainly not in the Heartbleed incident. Certainly not. What well, was broken? The open SSL implementation. Someone screwed up. Someone thought that me managing memory that way was a really great idea, and it wasn't. Someone thought that doing something a novel way instead of a more proven way was a good idea, and it wasn't. Someone here thought that they could, um, because of other, thi other things in place, um, that it was sufficiently secure, or they thought that security wasn't a concern at all. We'll never know. So really, this is, this is really at the feet of the integrator. You know, in some ways, in some ways, it's fun to knock, you know, your local cities or governments or whatnot for like, oh, buffoons. But really, we put so much in the hands of private companies um, who take government money and are supposed to provide a service. I presume the mayor pro tem of a small city like uh, the one that we're dealing with here, um, that guy's in. You have to feel bad for him. He's in no position to evaluate the security of the finished product. Any more than my grandmother is, you know, should be knocked for going. Oh, honey, you got the whole internet on your phone. I mean, what, what, are you gonna, what, what do you expect from her? What do you expect from someone like a city mayor or a city manager? Uh, they, depend on, they depend on the integrator that, who they paid substantial sums of money for. Um, a nearby city was uh, paid half a million dollars for uh, something like a handful of cameras. Um, it wasn't really related to the talk, but it was, uh, it was a very recent award um, for their proposal. Half a million dollars. Will they get better security? I mean, it's 2014. I hope so. Is anyone on, in the city actually capable of evaluating it post-install? I don't know. I'm doubtful. These are, I mean, these are small cities. The city of LA, city of Chicago, city of New York. Big cities like that? Sure. I would imagine so. Is there even an IT department? Is there anyone who can do uh, a post-install test? 
one of the things that I often talk about just in terms of um, providing IT services to our clients is do we test it in ways okay, here, here's a personal anecdote for me back in the days of going desk to desk as an IT lackey at my last corporate gig uh, whenever I set up a new computer for, a cl uh, for a, an employee uh, I would always forget to install the printers probably because I don't really print anything um, I don't have a need to print out a lot of paper. I never really have. Uh, but these people do. I don't understand. Our clients print more than anybody I've ever seen in life. And if that printer isn't, isn't there, I'm going to get a call immediately. In the same way, I, th I feel like we often assume in the security world, um, you know, we, a here's, here's another one, um, filtering services based on IP, right? Only certain IPs on the, on the network can talk to this service. Did anyone actually test it from an IP that's not in that whitelist? Did anyone actually test it? Thank you. That sign was clear as day. Thank you. I was nervous about missing that. Did anyone actually test it? Mm, I, I presume, I'm, I'm guessing not. I think that's what I call the hubris of IT people. Guilty right here. Presuming a lot of you, if you, we do some uh, self reflection, we'll, uh, we'll also see that we're all guilty of it. Hubris that we know what we're doing. We've done it a few times, a lot of times maybe. It's worth checking. I know residents are upset that they're being monitored all the time. They aren't thrilled about it. But uh, I saw a comic recently that said, how do, you want the, how do you want to sell this to the American people? And it was a gift wrap. And it was like protecting children or you know, uh, fighting terrorists. They sold this in terms of public safety. And um, from there, the public was satiated sufficiently enough. We quieted enough voices that um, the system got rolled out. Now there's ubiquitous surveillance. I'm guessing people wouldn't be happy if they found out that their sister's brother's kid could watch all the cameras too. Or perhaps much worse, um, going through these potential threats um, beyond just the security weaknesses. So here's some of the things that we theorized and tested in our lab. So these things work on a, on a flawed implementation like this. Oh, big warning here. Federal and state wiretapping lawsuits may apply. So uh, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, so seek the advice of someone who would know about these things, like the EFF. Um, don't go running afoul of wiretapping laws. So clearly we've talked about um, in a flawed implementation like this one, prior to 72 hours ago, observing video streams is trivial. Um, or because they're multicast, you could just subscribe yourself. Why not? Like with any wireless system, but, but especially one that you can actually participate in the network in a meaningful way, um, there's deniable service opportunities. Um, simply by flooding, crude jamming, um, oversubscribing, these little, I mean, these are, like I said, these are normal off the shelf cameras, nothing special here. They're not prepared to have, uh, you know, a thousand bogus subscription requests. How about ARP spoofing? You could actually become a node on the network or actually become uh, the DVR or, or what they often term the network video recorder. Dirty. Dirtier though, and totally worthy of a doge, is uh, joining the mesh legitimately like I said. There's only 256 mesh IDs. All you have to do is, uh, you, have to, you don't even have to guess. You can just read it and go, oh, this is mesh number three. I'm mesh number three. And now you're, a, you, as far as anyone can tell, you're a legitimate node on their network. I'm guessing that there aren't a lot of separation, there isn't a lot of separation between these, um, the cameras, the network DVRs, and the rest of uh, the city's networks. They've often, they've left themselves wide open um, to anyone who can listen or, or participate in the network with accessing services that they simply weren't prepared to have public access to. And honestly, guys, it, for the police department, you've got, you ought to start thinking about things like um, reliability of evidence or documents. Um, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but it would concern me that potentially evidence could be tampered with um, from, from 50 miles away. Well, you're Just, basically plugged in. I mean, yeah, you, you may as well have walked in. And you may as well have plugged switch. in. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Found a hot port in their office, and, and you can participate on the yeah. network. Video manipulation. Um, yeah, think Ocean's Eleven or any spy movie. I think every spy movie has, a, has something like this where um, you've got the board, you, you know, you've got the board uh, security guard with all the video monitors, you know, and it's the middle of the night and he's watching and, you know, and the, 
the guys you're supposed to root for, I suppose, um, take over one of the video cameras and play back a loop, I call the all is well loop, right? An empty corridor. Whereas in reality, when the camera cuts, right, you know, all our, all our good guys are, you know, making their way down the corridor. Entirely possible uh, through, this, through, the, through the, what I call the UP, UDP in increment attack. Video is usually transmitted via RTP, which are UDP packets. And this is how it would work. So this is my illustration from this morning. Um, you've got a municipal camera community to the municipal DVR. The 100, 101, 102, these are packet numbers. These are, um, which, are which simply are incremented after, as the next packet is sent. Remember, this is UDP and this is key. With a malicious node, thank you. With a malicious node sending their own UDP stream of RTP packets, all we have to do is jump ahead. So if the highest packet they're on is 106, I'll just jump to 200. My video packet is now 200, 201, 202, 203. Think about, what's going, think about what happens next. The DVR goes, whoa, I'm still getting some packets that are way out of order. These are dupes or they've expired. I can just ignore them. I've literally now, just by incrementing the UDP count, have just taken over and the DVR would now try. It has no reason not to, right? It's functioning as intended. Um, because we're using UDP, we can just throw away all the packets that are. Now these packets, this 100, these packets will continue to arrive and they're always ignored. Because, uh, say somewhere along the line, right? It happens. If you watch enough network traffic, you see things like this happen. Packets arrive out of order. It happens. What do you, and what do you do with UDP? You discard them. So you can, you can just with this, just by incrementing the UDP count, um, you can completely take over the network. And here's the other danger is, the cameras are trusted. I mean, you could do all kinds of tomfoolery like, you know, hey, let's have Godzilla walk down the street. Um, or, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do. Or you can do things like project that every, all is well at, you know, all is well at the city bank, but in reality it's being robbed. Well, I'm getting calls, but I don't know, Frank, I'm looking at the camera and everything looks fine from here. A bunch of pranksters. Hooligans. Um, there's also, the, you can also do the opposite, send police resources elsewhere through, um, through uh, injecting uh, false, faulty data like that. Not to mention, look, I've got a friend who works at, not a, I don't want to identify him. I, I know someone that works at Verizon Wireless, and what he tells me is, oh, yeah, 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 you know, there's people that look at all your dirty texts. So, uh, yeah, and there's someone that sits in there. Someone has access to them all. Or um, what, are the, what it was the recent couple weeks ago at the NSA, right? Well, that's the problem with having 20-year-olds work at the NSA is that everyone's looking at, all the, at everyone's, you know, dirty pictures. Who's... Who's, who do we trust to look at all this data that's been collected, that's archived? Um, these are privacy implications, along, you know, along with all the weaknesses that go along with it. Um, things that maybe, maybe not everyone's thought deeply enough about. Security is complicated, and it interacts with things like privacy and policy and other government things. Uh, I think sometimes we often think of ourselves as just tech people, and not often enough as uh, citizens that have to participate in, frankly, in a 2014 world. So our demo is sad because of WEP, because um, we can't break it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the person who writes the checks is, is now actually thinking because we ought not try, <laughs> um, because of uh, potential liability. So I know we promised a demo, um, and I'm very sorry. But thank you for coming and filling this whole room. Um, it's I think it's a, always this, a speaker's concern that uh, you know. When I spoke two years ago, there was a really, really, really great talk at the same time as mine. And so I walked in with all these people here and they all bailed out, like half of them, before I started. So thanks so much for your attention. Um, if anyone has questions, we're going to be out front.